welcome to uh, our um, COVID-19 Epidemiology Grand Round, sponsored by the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at uh, UCSF. Um, we are living in unprecedented times, and uh, never has it been more important to understand epidemiology and its principles that um, are uh, increasingly important for helping us both to understand and manage this pandemic. Um, that little video that you uh, saw there, some of you who are on Twitter might recognize it as a very funny clip of uh, somebody who's an armchair epidemiologist, which has become very, uh, um, epidemiology has become um, sort of a, a, a favorite among many, and, um, and this is a very funny clip on an armchair epidemiologist. Our goal is here to uh, to uh, make sure that we all become a little bit better at our armchair epidemiology by learning from uh, the experts. So today, um, we will have an update on COVID-19 epidemiology. We will understand a little bit more about the uh, mathematical principles uh, for modeling of COVID-19. We will learn about frameworks for understanding the disparities that are emerging in COVID-19 and then learn about the principles of contact tracing and uh, UCSF's uh, partnership with the San Francisco Department of Public Health in this work. Uh, I'm really pleased today uh, to uh, invite uh, to speak um, Dr. George Rutherford, who is the Chief of Infectious Disease and Global Epidemiology in the department. Um, he is also in the Department of Pediatrics and in the UCSF Institute for Global Health Sciences. Dr. Travis Porco is a biostatistician and mathematical modeler in the Department of Ophthalmology and uh, Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Dr. Maria Gleemore is a social epidemiologist and director of our PhD program in the department. And Dr. Michael Reed is a physician and infectious disease specialist um, who uh, is in the Department of Medicine and um, the Institute for Global Health Sciences. If you, uh, the format of this will be a 15 minute presentation, 10 to 15 minutes from each of the uh, presenters. Um, and then um, there will be a uh, panel discussion. Um, and uh, if you have questions, I invite you to um, uh, enter them in the Q&A function. That's the best way uh, to, to get the questions um, uh, answered. And we will uh, do those. Um, I will be monitoring them as we go. Um, we're scheduled to go for roughly 90 minutes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, uh, Dr. George Rutherford. Thank you, Kirsten, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Kristen, may I have the first slide, please? That is who I had on my first slide right there. There we go. Thank you. So this is so the uh, uh, epidemic of COVID-19 has, um, could you just open that up all the way, please? That great, thanks. Uh, the epidemic of COVID-19 has uh, spread around the world. Um, we're almost now up to 2 million cases starting originally in China, then spreading through Iran to Europe and from Europe uh, to the Americas, as well as from China um, to, the, uh, to the Americas. Um, there have been 114,000 deaths uh, that have been recorded, and the U.S. is far, far, far and away the most affected country, although I think there's still probably more cases in Europe than there are in the U.S. May I have the next one, please? This shows you the, uh, the uh, epidemiology over time, essentially an epi curve back here in the... Um, to the left is uh, in the orange is, uh, is China, the outbreak in China, with that one giant spike of being a change in case definition. The salmon is what's happened in, in Europe. Uh, the purple is what's happening in Iran, mostly, although there's been some spread to the uh, Persian Gulf states. And then the yellow are the Americas, which for those of you who don't know the WHO regions nearly as intimately as I do, that's uh, everything from the North Pole to the South Pole in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, almost all of these cases, or the vast majority of these cases, are in the United States. The next one, please. And here we are in the, the here we are in the United States, where as of this morning, 
there are almost 560,000 cases um, and 22,000 uh, deaths with a uh, with a disproportionate, uh, large disproportionate number in the eastern seaboard from Boston uh, now down into uh, to DC with other urban centers um, in Chicago, Detroit, New Orleans, uh, and increasingly in the large southern cities of Atlanta, Dallas, Houston. Um, in the west, Seattle, uh, in the Seattle King County area was originally heavily affected mostly through outbreaks in nursing homes. That was where the original, the initial case of, of uh, community transmission in the United States was first seen. Uh, and then uh, the Bay Area, predominantly Santa Clara County, we'll get a lot more into that, and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the next one, please. Here we are in San Francisco, um, and everybody asks us if social distancing's working. Um, this uh, we had a, an outbreak uh, over the on Friday. There's from between Wednesday and Friday last week of 70 cases uh, in one of the large homeless shelters, um, which has now been evacuated and people have all been put into hotels. Um, you can see the those spikes with uh, 73 cases and 60 cases on Saturday and Sunday. Um, but this morning we're back to uh, 15 cases. I hear there's another. Uh, a few, um, uh, another sort of load of cases coming in now, but this is kind of where we are. The way I think about this, and this will make Travis uh, grow old quickly, is that if you take the first death and go back three weeks, that's what we need to be, two more beyond that, please, Chris, Kirsten. One, and one more, and one more, I'm sorry, I was three more beyond that. Yeah, if you think back three weeks from the first death, that's the time when this was when the virus was circulating in the community. Um, so that would have meant that we had uh, was, was circul. This is very rough. Okay, um, it was circulating in um, say early March. Uh, so between early March and when shelter in place was declared on midnight on March sixteenth, that was a period of roughly two weeks. Um, so that's how fast this this uh, came into place. And at the time, this was somewhat of a curiosity, although we all knew it was coming. And I think the mayor and Dr. Colfax uh, and then the other supervisors and other health officers around the Bay Area deserve tremendous credit for uh, taking what at the time was felt to be a very bold, as in reckless, uh, move. The next one, please. Uh, here are the current uh, uh, numbers as of uh, yesterday uh, with, or sorry, uh, as of Saturday afternoon, they have updated with 872 cases, 14 deaths uh, in the city uh, with uh, the preponderance of cases among 31 to 40, uh, 40 year olds uh, for 30% for whom race is unknown, 25% uh, Latin, Latin X. Uh, and uh, only 15% Asian or Pacific Islanders, which we ex had expected to be early, uh, I'm sorry, which we had earlier expected to be higher, largely because of the uh, initial importations from, from China. The next one, please. Um, this is what we're trying to avoid. This is infectious disease mortality per 100,000 per year in the United States from 1900 to 1996. At large spike is the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, uh, which you can see almost reached a thousand deaths per hundred thousand uh, that year as a single cause of mortality. COVID, by the way, has become the leading cause of mortality in the United States this year, surpassing cardiovascular disease about five days ago. Uh, the next one, please. So, what are the lessons from the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic? Believe me, these are front and center. And um, when we, early on, when uh, uh, we first started talking with uh, uh, Grant Colfax about options, both Art Reingold and I almost simultaneously said St. Louis. Uh, this is St. The lower curve, the flattened curve, if you will, is St. Louis in the 1918 uh, influenza where they began social distancing, which was always sort of most, somewhat curious to read at the time, but social distancing consisted of in 1918. But um, they began it before they really had their first death. 
uh, whereas uh, Philadelphia was about three quarters of the way on the upslope of this curve, the blue curve before they began it, and also had a huge war bonds parade right in the uh, right in early September, which really tipped this up and over the uh, over the edge. So this so the lessons here are to begin social distancing interventions early, but also to keep them going. You can see that there was a rebound uh, in St. Louis, a, a bump up in mortality. When they were trying, when they let the interventions off, which turns out to be a little early. The next one, please. So, the early empirical evidence that social distancing works comes from Italy, uh, and these are two provinces in Italy, Lodi and Bergamo, uh, which aren't the same size. But I think for these kinds of comparisons, looking at absolute numbers of cases rather than trying to standardize them by population is probably more useful. Uh, uh, Lodi, which was where the first big case, uh, first big outbreak of COVID-19 was in Italy. These are near Milan. Um, uh, you can see went to social, uh, went to sheltering in place on uh, February uh, 26th, um, February 26th, and uh, has maintained a low level of transmission throughout this period. And I want to credit uh, uh, Shah Radari, and uh, uh, who's a fourth year medical student who's supposed to be rotating at CDC this month, and I got him instead. Um, and uh, Mia Kanzawa is a first year resident in our program, and Hillary Spindler, uh, all for, uh, for contributing to these analyses. So you can see what happened here uh, with, uh, and the, the difference seems to be the intervention, although, you know, these things are typically multifactorial. multifactorial. The next one, please. So never being dissuaded from making outrageous comparisons. The next one, please. I made the same slide for, uh, next one, please. For San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles went to shelter in place three days after San Francisco did. But I think more telling is the, is the first death. So if you go back three weeks from the first death, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, that's something like the 19th of, of February. So it was a full month uh, plus before they went to shelter in place, whereas in San Francisco went to shelter in place within two weeks. Um, given the density of San Francisco, one would have expected more transmission um, than in Los Angeles, but nonetheless, this is how it's, uh, how it's played out. They actually went to shelter in place on the 20th of of March, the, my shadow has crept away over time. Um, so yeah, we could we could talk about how Los Angeles is eleven times bigger and all that, but these are rare diseases, and uh, I think it's more useful to look at numerators than denominators. The next one, please. Here's the same game being played with Los Angeles and Los Angeles and New York. Um, interestingly. Uh, the first death in Los Angeles was before the first death in New York. Um, but, uh, but the shelter in place in Los Angeles was uh, essentially like three days earlier. New York is called pause. And you can see things were already way out of control in New York before they went to shelter in place. Um, in Los Angeles, th there was a brief uptick uh, towards the end of March, uh, with kind of a leveling out in the four to 500 cases per day range, uh, in New York, as you can see, it's continued to climb these last, this last little dip is really a function of, of, uh, delays in reporting, uh, rather than anything else. So you can see if you're going to want to do this, the time to do it is not after the, uh, after you have 3,500 cases a day. Uh, the next one, please. We've also been doing syndromic surveillance in, in San Francisco, and I want to thank Mark Pletcher uh, for providing data from the citizen scientists. This is what I meant to correct. The blue line is actually any flu-like or any kind of uh, uh, viral syndrome, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cough, myalgias, those kinds of things, fever. Um, and you can see that's coming down as one would expect as the seasons change. The combination of fever or chills and cough or shortness of breath has remained consistently less than 1% across this period of time. Um, and speaking of non-random samples, we also have data from the from a thermometer manufacturer who actually electronic thermometer 
manufacturer called Kinsa, uh, which is a um, which sends the data up into the cloud, and you can get it back by um, uh, by kind of area. Uh, and this is what their fever profile uh, looks like. So, you know, we, we're not still not quite sure how to use all these things, but. I'd have to say it's going in the right direction and not the wrong direction, which is why you want sentinel surveillance or syndromic surveillance. The next one, please. Um, this is what it's all about. And Travis will talk about models, but the models that, uh, uh, that we've been doing for the city, both Travis's group and uh, Maya uh, Peterson at, at Berkeley's group have uh, focused, have been anchored on bed days and bed utilization, which is what the real question uh, is. Um, and you can see that we're now at 70, sorry, 82 beds uh, with a high on April 9th of 88 beds. When we start talking about models, take a look and see where the high is and you can see how, how pretty close these things are. Now with this outbreak in the homeless shelter, you know, this is going to bump up again. Uh, but uh, I, I think that this we're pretty much is a pretty good representation of, uh, of what's going on in the city and uh, bed space availability and you know relatively lower demand than was anticipated uh, the next one please and then and the next one please the next one please so finally just to say i, I have a slide of the of the models uh, from uh, the famous Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation Models, which is what the White House Task Force uh, is using. Uh, and they predict that the, uh, that the highest peak in California will be essentially now. Uh, we're talking about maybe a day ago, maybe a day from now, but it's like right through here uh, where we're not going to be strapped for ventilators, we're not going to be strapped for ICU beds, and we're not going to be strapped for general acute care beds. I'd also would want to point out that if you believe the White House task force's original numbers that predicted 2.2 million deaths in the United States, yeah, that one, please. Um, um, that would be 264,000 deaths in California and 44,484 in the six county Bay Area. We're currently at 137. So when you tell your children about the practice of public health, Remember that statistic. So from 484,000 to 137. Uh, each death is tragic, but it's it's like this is a big drop. Thanks. George, thank you very much. That uh, that is um, that's that's really great. Um, I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. I, we have uh, some questions starting to gather, but we can take them uh, when we talk all together. Thank you. We'll invite you back at the end, George. Go to Travis. Yes, good morning. And the slides will be shown by as before. Kristen, I think is, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thanks very, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to provide here just a short overview of some of the mathematical models that have been developed more for the sake of context and perspective. There have been a very large number of such mathematical models published, and I, I certainly won't talk about all of them. And the fact that I don't mention one doesn't indicate any disapproval of that model. So the rationale for mathematical models in this epidemic is, as you all I'm sure are aware, is that we would like to consider plausible scenarios based on current knowledge, or at least reasonable belief. These are really meant to be used practically to guide response, and in particular to assist with resource planning. Uh, the next slide. So an overview of what a lot of these models have in common is early exponential growth. The idea being that each case will cause a certain number of new cases. And then those cases will in turn cause the same number of new cases and so forth. Such considerations leading directly to a prediction of exponential growth consistent with what we see. But the challenge is to determine when we depart from exponential growth. Do we depart simply because the epidemic gets so large 
that we begin to deplete the number of susceptibles? Obviously, we hope not. Is it the result of a seasonal effect? Is it really true that in the summer, things will become more favorable from the standpoint of COVID transmission? Or is it because we've implemented control measures? So determining when we turn off of this is the real challenge. So next slide. Now, it's, it's obviously not um, news to any of you that exponential growth has been on everyone's mind. Here's a slide from something called Minute Physics um, on YouTube sort of discussing exponential growth. I'm sure many of you have seen these, these figures uh, re regarding this. So let's go to the next slide, please. So here we see some, some data from California. I've, I've plotted the, on a log plot, the cumulative confirmed cases in, in this spaghetti plot. You can see this for a number of, for, for essentially every California county. And so with exponential growth, we would see a linear curve on this log plot, but none of these curves really look linear anymore. And this is convincing evidence that we have begun to turn, you know, change the, the power that the pattern has changed the 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 large red curve you see at the top is los angeles and i, I can't really show you this but the the blue curve that crosses it around the middle of this is santa clara county so the the curvature here is again a clear indication of, of departure from exponentiality and again further evidence in my view that we have made a difference the, the p value for those of you who are interested is less than 0.01 let me go go to the next slide so what are some of the approaches that modelers have been using well the first thing to consider when looking at a model is whether it is mechanistic or what i'll call statistical what i really mean here is has the modeler tried to represent through mathematical analogy the different processes that are going on the number of people who are infected the way that an infected person puts other people at risk perhaps the model will be even more detailed and will include an explicit representation of schools workplaces hospitals and other features of the real world or is the model statistical in the sense that they're trying to describe the quantitative data but they're not really trying to to model the process so these are two approaches is the model simple versus complex and is the person really trying to break mathematical or conceptual ground or to test a new theory or are they trying to guide a practical policy so we, these are several dimensions that we can consider models on i'll go to the next slide so <clears throat> as i say in a, in a mechanistic model we, we intend to develop a mathematical analogy uh, to to the actual mechanism our hope is really to represent or to relate individual level processes to population level trends the hope is that by doing so, we can buy a little bit of greater generalizability uh, by use of these assumptions. Whereas in a non-mechanistic model, we would like a parsimonious or effective statistical description of these trends that might be suitable for, for long-term or rather for short-term, for example, projections. I'll go on to the next slide. Here, uh, sorry. There's some individual level behavior. This is something I took from the Denver Denver Post. And so you see why at some level you can't really hope to truly deduce from first principles the behavior of this epidemic. You know, what is, what has one to go from scenes like this to an, an actual um, estimate of the, the future trajectory so so the even the mechanistic models will always contain a very strong and important statistical component where we try to estimate some overall parameters based on the actual data let me go to the next slide so a useful concept that you you will have seen in, in essentially nearly all mechanistic models is the concept of the reproduction number that is the number of cases that a case on average causes during its uh, existence as a case. If that's less than one, the disease has to be in decline. The disease is not, so to speak, breaking even. If each case before, you know, recover, you know, 
unfortunately more bounty, but during the period of infectivity, if each case can't replace itself, the disease is not from its standpoint breaking even. Whereas if each case is more than replacing itself, you'll you expect a growth. Uh, you can derive these based on a model, or you can try to estimate it from the data using a model. So let's continue to the next slide. So <clears throat> something you may have seen when we talk about mechanistic models, a common class of such models are that, that you will have seen in, in the literature are this type of compartment model. And one type is called susceptible, exposed, infective, removed, or SEIR. This class of models, right, this general idea, which is really related to chemistry, some of the models in chemistry, dates back to the 1920s. And it's it's been, there, there's, I don't know, 10,000 papers on topics like this. Uh, Herb Hethcote, uh, Norman Bailey's book from the 1970s, uh, Anderson and May's uh, famous book, uh, all discuss this type of model. And there, a recent one was done by uh, Wu, Wu et al. looking at this particular epidemic. And so I'll say, so the idea here is we, we consider that an individual could be susceptible there they are, you know, anybody, when they're exposed to the disease and they have become um, infected, but they're not yet infectious, we're calling them in this exposed category. Eventually, the ongoing progression of the infection leads to the individual being an infective. And then afterwards, they are removed, you know, for any number of reasons due to quarantine, uh, mortality, or recovery. So they leave this, the, the category of being infectious to others in the population. They enter the removed class. So let me continue to the next slide. Um, so the, the idea here is that we will often assume that the hazard for infection is proportional either to the absolute number of cases or to the prevalence fraction of the population. We may try to represent the incubation period and the, inf or, and the infectious period based on data, or we may use simple approximations. Uh, such models can often appear to fit the data to be well. And these are, models are very easy to build uh, in many cases. So let's go to the next slide. So for, for example, a few lines in a, any standard statistics package suffice to build an SEIR model. So there's a screen cap from an R program that can run this. If we assume an incubation period of five days, we can decide if you like that number. If you assume an infectious period of seven, then you, 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 then you could just play with the model yourself and you would find an R of about five would fit the Los Angeles data prior to the state shelter in place order. I'm not endorsing the figure of five. I'm only saying that one could uh, very easily experiment with these models and simulate the epidemic given assumptions of your own choosing. Let's go to the next slide. And, and here is an example of the use of an SEIR model in a hypothetical California city in which we begin social distancing at day 50, which results in a swiftly visible change in the, the cumulative case count on a log scale. There's various formulas in the literature derived by modelers that will allow you to, to t take the slope of this curve and just read off the reproduction number. So there's a, a paper by um, uh, where during uh, Rouhani and, and um, uh, Matt Keeling that gives a very nice discussion of this. So let's continue to the next slide. Uh, so in, the, to, in contrast, there are short term uh, or at least projection models. These are statistical rather than mechanistic. Some assume exponential growth and then they try to estimate what the dampening would be from control measures. The IHFME projections uh, are of this type. They're revised frequently as more information becomes available. And all of you know where that website is and you can read more about what they've been doing bringing new data online to calibrate their models and, and continuing to, to update these. Uh, some such models uh, may, may underrepresent true forecasting uncertainty uh, for reasons we can talk more about. Let's continue to the next slide. 
Uh, and finally, I'll say a word about simple versus complex. Simple models, uh, on the one hand, aim for insight through simplicity. Uh, others attempt to, to achieve realism through detail. Uh, my feeling is that both classes of models are important. Uh, one hesitates to trust a complex black body or black box model. One hesitates to trust that. And at the same time, the simple models, while you can have more reliable, you can believe that they're more accurately implemented and they help you understand what's happening. You do have a nagging doubt. What if some aspect that's been omitted turns out to be important? However, the even the most complex models we have are still very simple compared with what's actually happening in the world. And even mod, even when we think we understand it, there may be fundamental features we just haven't thought of and don't understand. Let's continue to the next slide. So the Imperial uh, College model that we, we've seen uh, is, is based on a pre-existing influenza model. It is mechanistic. It is quite complex and intricate. A lot of thought and energy has gone into uh, building uh, th this model. They've used plausible estimates of transmission in various settings to explore school closure and other strategies. Um, their paper, you know, they haven't looked at all strategies, right? It's one, one paper. There are other platforms by other groups, such as the FRED platform developed by Pittsburgh. There's, um, you know, the, the, the Florida group, uh, Arlon Gini and, and uh, Vespagnani have a detailed agent-based simulation. Uh, the Virginia group has detailed simulations and also Los Alamos, I believe, has a detailed simulation. So a number of groups working on these in different ways. And these are typically, as I say, complex mechanistic models. And they, they, they're often the result of a lot of work that's gone into pandemic influenza preparation. So let's go to the next slide. So I do want to just finally say that a model can't be expected to perform beyond what it was designed to do. Uh, the, the model builders have designed each model for a specific purpose, and you can't push them beyond that and then expect it to work. Uh, I believe we should keep an eye on whether models are capable of prediction. A good model should be able to predict, but that's not enough. Sometimes a bad model can at least appear to predict for a short while. And the question is, you know, what sort of predictions are we really looking for? Finally, as you evaluate models that continue to come down the road, I don't know the exact number, but there's, as I say, quite a few. It's often the case that there's substantial disagreement among models, and sometimes models may reflect uh, a certain perspective, and one has to view it with uh, skepticism. And again, to keep an eye always on whether a model is capable of prediction. Uh, I have some some additional slides that will feature some of the work that our, our group has been doing. Uh, Lee Warden, a postdoctoral fellow, and Ray Wanye, a graduate student. But I'd like to stop here and come back to that uh, later, if time permits, uh, during uh, the discussion. That's great. That's great. Um, I think, uh, thank you, Travis. I think there'll, there'll be a lot of interest in that, I think, uh, especially because many of your, um, because you're modeling what's happening uh, locally. And I know we'll have a lot of, of questions uh, about that. So they've come through on the chat. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to, uh, to Maria Gleemore to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, frameworks for understanding the disparities that are emerging. Great, thank you. Um, I'm very curious to see Travis's, the rest of Travis's slides. Um, Kristen, are you? Um, <laughs> or shall I share my screen? Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful that we're talking about disparities, that it's, that it's emerging um, as high on the priority list as we discuss COVID. Next slide. Um, I, I want to be specific because terms are used inconsistently by different researchers. I want to be specific that I'm talking about disparities that are not just health differences, but differences that are avoidable, unnecessary, and unjust. These typically follow along lines of traditional social power and inequity. Um, and health disparities researchers know inequities prevail across countless domains of health. And so we're not, we have not been surprised that that 
literally within four months of the first reported cases of an entirely new disease, we are seeing disparities. One of the most powerful theories in health disparity research is um, posits that there are certain resources that are very flexible that you can use to defend yourself against health threats from any source. And these are resources like money, knowledge, power, and prestige. And they're considered fundamental causes because even as new threats, health threats emerge, the, these resources help protect people from um, being affected by the disease. And we really think about systemic racism as sort of the opposite of a fundamental resource, um, as, as a fundamental cause of health inequalities. Next slide, please. Um, this is really important to, to address because one of the implications of uh, fundamental cause theory, we can move to the next slide, because yeah, thank you, is that technical progress alone, the, the, the research breakthroughs that we all hope for, better testing, better treatment, vaccines, these alone will not be enough to eliminate disparities. And in fact, technical progress can exacerbate disparities because individuals who have the most privilege and most resources are likely to take advantage of those those breakthroughs first. And so this can lead to um, counterintuitively lead to growing disparities as we learn more about how to prevent and treat a disease. COVID-19, uh, we are already seeing, will have health effects directly via infection, but also indirectly via social, behavioral, and economic changes attributable to the COVID response. Um, these consequences are likely to be differential for many groups, including individuals in low wage or limited flexibility jobs, people who cannot so cannot avoid going to uh, cannot avoid exposure during their work, or and cannot afford to not work, individuals who are already financially vulnerable, people of color because of uh, the history of segregation and geographic patterns, as well as experiences of racism, and individuals with high burden of pre-existing chronic conditions. All of these groups are likely to be differentially affected. Next slide. Um, so what do we have, what, what's the evidence so far on disproportionate impacts? There's actually very little qual quantitative evidence on, on likely dimensions of inequality that will probably emerge in the future. We do have some evidence on racial ethnic differences. I want to begin as a true epidemiologist by caveating that there are major data limitations. And I'll come back to this, but the data limitations are really important to recognize because they change the interpretation, but they also will, will frame our policy responses. Many of the deaths um, that are probably attributable to COVID infections have not been necessarily classified correctly on the, on the death certificates. We get, are guessing there are undiagnosed cases. Disentangling testing rates from infection rates and case fatality rates makes interpreting uh, racial ethnic patterns very challenging. Uh, almost most places have substantial missing or misclassified race ethnicity on, on for example, death certificates or in case, um, case reports. And there's lack of adjustment, of age adjustment, age being one of the most important um, potential confounders. That said, we are seeing racial ethnic patterns in mortality. I'm gonna focus on the mortality data because I think it's a little bit uh, better than the case diagnosis data. Um, but those, those patterns are actually pretty different across different parts of the United States. I'm gonna talk um, specifically about California and New York. Next slide. So if we look at California, um, and I'm gonna ask you to focus on the uh, right two columns here, the percent deaths compared to percent of the California population in each racial ethnic group. What we see is that Latinos are underrepresented compared to their proportion in the California population. Whites, Asians, African Americans are overrepresented. Caveat that um, these are not age adjusted, and also about 16% of deaths have not been have no racial ethnic classification as of yet. Um, we do know that there are differences in the likelihood that that uh, race ethnicity is misclassified in administrative records, including death certificates. And specifically, people uh, Latinos are most are one of the groups most likely to be misclassified. So, if you actually account for the 16% of deaths that have not yet been classified, it can entirely change the picture for Latinos, whites, and Asians. However, no, even with any plausible redistribution of those cases, you still see a disparity for blacks. Um, next slide, please. The story is um, even starker in New York, where if you look at age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 population, you see that Latinos and African Americans have about double the age-adjusted death rate compared to whites. There's a really pretty stark in, um, inequality there. Um, next slide. I want to move next to thinking about um, 
the indirect effects of COVID-19 because I think that these ultimately will be huge. Unemployment is toxic. On the left here, you see a forest plot of a, of a meta-analysis of the effects of unemployment on all-cause mortality. And across all those studies, the meta-analyzed hazard ratio suggested that having a history of being unemployed increased mortality by about 62% over the subsequent 10 years. Um, and only about a quarter of this association was mediated by things like health behaviors. Um, if you juxtapose that 62% elevation in mortality um, against these approximately 16 million people who recently filed unemployment claims, you can see how huge that effect is <clears throat> if the association between unemployment and mortality that we've seen in the past carries through in this context. Um, these consequences are going to be um, unequal. There is a recent a Pew survey that was in March, so this was just at the beginning, indicated that about 33% of households overall and nearly half of Latino households had a household member who had taken a pay cut or had been laid off, lost their job due to COVID. So these impacts are going to be huge and long lasting unless we had very specific policy efforts to remediate those consequences. Next slide. So what do we do? What do we need to do? Number one is we need to document the direct and indirect impact of COVID among vulnerable groups. Missing data is a political issue. If there's no data, it's very easy to say there's no problem. It is critical that we gather the evidence on exactly who is being affected and how they're being affected. We also need to understand the mechanisms with enough specificity that we can guide policy responses, whether those are healthcare interventions or, or larger policy, um, government policies. We need to understand whether the mechanisms are medical care access, income stability, food security, stigma and racism, or other mechanisms. These are all amenable to interventions and it's important that we understand their impacts. I want to turn now briefly to talk about some of the projects rolling out at UCSF that are going to um, be exploring um, or trying to address uh, health disparities related to COVID. And this is just a sampling. I could not get through everything. So uh, I'll, go, I'll go quickly and I apologize in advance for the things that I've missed. Uh, next slide. Um, first, I want to mention uh, work uh, led by Dr. Rita Hamad and um, Rafael and colleagues. Uh, to use um, electronic medical records from UCSF, from um, SF Gen Zuckerberg, SF General, and the Health Network Clinics to explore not just racial ethnic disparities, but also other dimensions of inequality, insurance status, language, housing status, and neighborhood characteristics, and how those influence COVID outcomes. One of the interesting things about their project is that they are um, really comparing this to other, other um, conditions, including all-cause hospitalization, influenza, and appendicitis to understand which mechanisms are specific to COVID versus mechanisms that are um, broadly relevant. Next slide. Um, the next project uh, that I want to mention is uh, uh, led by Dr. Megan Morris. Um, and uh, Dr. Morris is an assistant professor in the Department of Epi and Biostats, and she's really leveraging some long-standing work that she's been doing with vulnerable communities in the Bay Area and to understand how the pandemic is affecting um, older adults experiencing homelessness, people who inject drugs, and medically underserved communities. They're drawing on people who are already participating in existing observational studies to do phone and online chat-based survey modules of health and social resources, perceptions of danger, um, and a host of other issues related to how these very vulnerable communities are being affected by, by the pandemic. Next slide. Um, Dr. Margaret Hanley is uh, who's a leader in our educational initiative on implementation science has a few initiatives, including with her colleagues on uh, the COVID-19 resource study, which focuses on English as a second language um, or non-English speaking individuals, making sure that they have the resources to engage in preventive behaviors like social distancing and testing, um, and really focuses on using implementation science concepts to address modifiable um, barriers and facilitators. Um, uh, Margaret's also working on um, uh, working with ESL resources and training programs to get health education out for resources to help this community um, understand COVID prevention and access services. Um, next slide. Very briefly, a few other projects. Dr. Susie Martinez um, is uh, has been working with the University of California students who access basic needs services and is planning to rule out a survey of these students and how they anticipate that the pandemic may be affecting their housing security, food security, 
their ability to study, their mental health, and their ability to persist in, in school, which is obviously a very important issue. Um, our own Dr. Bivens Domingo is uh, launching a project on out-of-hospital deaths to understand people who die outside of the hospital and may not have been identified in the system um, and whether their vulnerable populations are differentially affected by that. And Dr. Brittany Chambers is um, fielding the EMBODY study as an add-on to the SOLAR study, which is a, a study of adverse birth outcomes among Black and um, Latinx individuals in the Bay Area. And their goal is to really understand the intersections between stress related to COVID-19 and stress related to racism and financial stress that is ongoing, and how that's impacting outcomes for um, uh, for perinatal outcomes. Next slide. Um, I want to, uh, just the last project I want to talk about is a project led by Dr. Tu Nguyen, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and an epidemiolo a social epidemiologist. And this was part of, built into an ongoing project she has to understand trends in racism, geographic patterns in racism and stigma. And she was concerned that as COVID emerged, that there would be a spike in Asia and racism and stigma around Asians if people associated, it, uh, associated the virus with um, China. And specifically, so they they use uh, a, a Twitter stream, so they have almost a million tweets, and Twitter has this API, so you can download those. They uh, identify the race-related um, tweets, including uh, formal terms and also slang and slurs, so that they can identify all of the relevant tweets, and then can characterize the sentiment as um, positive or negative, and compared before the emergence of COVID to after the emergence of COVID. And what you see here is if you look at the first row for tweets related to um, Hispanics, they see that really there's very little, little difference in the negative sentiment before in the November 2019 versus March 2020. Middle Easterners, uh, much more negative sentiment in both, both time periods, but really no change. Um, Black and African Americans, essentially no change. Whites, essentially no change. But a real spike for Asian and Pacific Islander groups um, suggesting that they're is a real concern about um, growing um, anti-Asian racism and stigma during that time period. Next slide. Um, I want to end by um, just some concluding thoughts. We are really seeing the tip of the iceberg for inequities in the direct and the indirect consequences of COVID. And addressing disparities has to be a high priority that we consider from the beginning that is built into our policy responses or else our breakthroughs may only exacerbate disparities. There's this phrase centering at the margins, which is thinking about the people who are most vulnerable and organizing responses to address those as the highest priority. So we should be prioritizing resources, care, and belief to disadvantaged communities most impacted. There is an urgent need for ongoing surveillance, better, more detailed surveillance, and we should think about the tools we're using for surveillance and how those may influence how we see disparities. So for example, the Kensa thermometers, which the, that data is so nifty, but it's really important to think about that in the context of disparities. Um, we also need causal mechanistic research um, to help guide policy responses. And on the last slide, I just put a few um, uh, people on Twitter that I like to follow and a few other resources. And I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Maria. Um, uh, much appreciated. And now we'll we'll turn to um, our last presenter, Mike Reed. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about contact tracing. Um, maybe I should say that in my pre-COVID work, I uh, was working as an HIV provider and was involved with uh, pet file programming in Africa and, and scale up. Of pet file programs, so I guess if, if I had a relevant expertise that that, that, that has come to bear, it, it's been implementation of programs in resource constrained settings. Um, let's wait for the slides to load, and then I'll begin. Thank you. Next slide. So, so first of all, um, you know, contact tracing um, is is a buzzword that has been in the mainstream media a lot over the last few days. What does it mean? Um, how does it relate to case investigation and what is that? What, what's the role of those things in uh, control of any kind of epidemic? 
So the idea, and this is what's really happening every day at, at 25th Street in Potrero, there's a team of case investigators. They're on the phone all day long, um, trying to understand with each individual case what, what happened, when did their symptoms develop, um, and then during the time that they were symptomatic, uh, who did they come into contact with, what kinds of activities were they engaged with, so that we can have a better understanding of of who was exposed to those individuals while they were suffering from COVID and, and as appropriate, identify those contacts so that we can reach out to them. And if they too have symptoms, offer them laboratory testing, uh, diagnostic capabilities, and as necessary, support them to self-quarantine, recognizing that those individuals that are close contacts of, uh, of, of person suffering from COVID are at highest risk of developing the infection themselves. Next slide. So this is just a, a sort of a, a, a very simple visual, visualization of why contact tracing makes sense. So you imagine a patient here, person A, who develops symptoms, he goes to work at Burger King, uh, he's working in, in, in the kitchen and, and, and after onset of pretty mild symptoms, he infects two of his work colleagues. Um, later, he goes and gets tested, and the doctor tells him, you need to stay at home. And after that point, he ceases to infect anybody else. Unfortunately, his two colleagues from Burger King both, both go home. Um, and as you can see, when there's a delay in, in, in those individuals accessing services, they too can go on to develop symptoms. But prompt contact tracing of person B in this scenario present, prevents them or supports them to uh, self-quarantine and therefore mitigate ongoing spread. It's very simply what contact tracing involves. Next slide. So what can we learn about this in the current COVID pandemic from other countries that have already started to ramp up contact tracing capability? I'm just giving you a few simple examples here. So South Korea, um, as you can see, the, the, the insert on the right of your screen has really done a tremendous job of flattening their curve. And they've done that in large part because they've been able to implement contact tracing capability um, in addition to uh, scaling up access to testing uh, by leveraging all sorts of important streams of data, credit card transactions, closed circuit TV, medical records, etc. Similarly, Taiwan has done a, 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 a robust job of, of, accurate, uh, of effectively reaching out to contacts of cases, again, using medical records, health insurance to reach out to individuals that are perceived to have been exposed um, and by providing services such as a hotline. Singapore um, famously developed an app in partnership with Google called Trace Together app. Uh, this is a Bluetooth enabled device that people voluntarily upload onto their phone. And, and, and if they come into contact with somebody who subsequently develops COVID, then their phone can be alerted if that COVID suffering individual um, chooses to um, highlight on the app that they've been infected. And so that, that tool has been used in Singapore in the context of a slew of, the, of other interventions. Next slide. Another setting that has done a phenomenal job of scaling up contact tracing is Wuhan, China, population of 11 million. They, they mobilized the workforce of 9,000 contact tracers to get on the phone, tracing tens of thousands of individuals a day. They had 1,800 teams of five persons on the phone reaching out to contacts of cases. New Zealand, slightly different scale. Um, that, you know, as of last week, they were reporting that they had mobilized 190 people to reach out to those suffering, those co connected to individuals suffering from COVID and, and using national uh, health databases to enhance the precision. And then Iceland have, have, have similarly done a, 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 an effective job um, mobilizing their police detective workforce in, in um in concert with a, a, a new application to accurately map where contacts are coming into contact with, with individuals that are diagnosed with COVID. Next slide. So it's clear, and this is something that I think George has spoken about before, if we're ever going to get to a point where we're able to lift the shelter in place, we have to have a number of critical public health capabilities in place. And as our um, 
national first scientist, Dr. Fauci, said on, on the news recently, we need at least the three, three things here. We need to be able to accurately and rapidly test individuals that are suffering from COVID. We need to be able to effectively isolate and support people in isolation. And finally, we need to do contact tracing. Next slide. So I think contact tracing raises a, a, a number of different questions. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of questions that, that, that one has to face, but where, where does that workforce come from? What kind of technology could, could public health departments leverage to do this more effectively? Um, what are the resources in the community that could be put, brought to bear on this, this endeavor? And, and if we're really serious about asking people to self-quarantine when they've come into contact with somebody with COVID, how do they, what are the services that they need in order to stay at home safely? Next slide. So let me start by talking about mobilizing the troops. So in, in Wuhan, as, as I mentioned, they mobilized 9,000 contact tracers, roughly one in 12,000 ratio. Um, uh, in, in New Zealand, they, they, they had a, a contact tracing ratio of one to 25,000. And just back of the envelope here in San Francisco, we, we think that we probably need between 100 and 150 individuals doing contact tracing if we, if we want to have a robust, sustainable um, uh, uh, contact tracing um, army. And this is just really based on a, a, a very simple set of calculations. You know, if we think that there might be 250 cases a day, um, and we think that each case um, has, has on average about five contacts, five close contacts, and, and we reckon that an individual contact tracer could reach out to three contacts an hour over cell phone, then we need at, at least 50 people working eight hour shifts a day. That may be an underestimate of, of the, the, the workforce needed, but maybe there are force multipliers, and technology and other efficiencies that could, could be leveraged. Certainly, I think across Northern California, there is going to be an urgent need to scale up a robust contact tracing capability. And, and people are guesstimating at three and a half thousand people to do this across the Bay Area and beyond. And maybe for the US, it's about 100,000 people deployed to do this, targeting areas of greatest need, inner cities and, and populations disproportionately affected by COVID. Next slide. So clearly, we also need some kind of technological platform, um, and, and and this has been a, a, a stream of work that I have been quite actively involved with over the last three or four weeks, working with the Department of Public Health to to determine how we could rapidly scale contact tracing and what kind of uh, digital solutions w w would be uh, fit for purpose. And just to be clear, whilst there are lots of really exciting um, uh, surveillance apps that you can load onto your phone. Um, that's really not what we were interested in. We were interested in a, a, a public health led digital solution that could be scaled rapidly and that would in this current moment allow a workforce to work remotely from home ideally um, recognizing that there aren't enough public health professionals in san francisco we wanted a solution that was simple that non-clinical non-public health staff could be trained to use very rapidly and and we needed it like yesterday <laughs> next slide so for the last week, and so we've only had one week using this platform, but we've been using ComCare, which is a digital solution developed by Dimaji. Dimaji is a, a social enterprise entity based out of Boston that designs clinical interfaces, um, health information systems, um, and, and they use an open source software technology. Um, and they have helped us to uh, develop and then adapt a platform that was actually initially embraced by colleagues at Santa Clara um, for our purposes here in San Francisco. And as of right now, we're actually a bit further on in terms of using this. We have an incredible workforce of, of, of staff and faculty from the Institute from Global Health Sciences at UCSF that have really, like, with, with huge force of industry, have been able to bring this platform to sort of clinical uh, programmatic inflammation in, a, in a, a really rapid space of time. Next slide. 
So what does the contact tracing team look like? Um, again, you know, we came up with this design really looking at what they've done in Wuhan, China. And so what we're doing right now, we have three teams a day with a plan to scale the number of teams in three shifts a day. Each team consists of a team clinician who's there to provide clinical backstop to the contact tracers. Um, that, 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 that individual also does sort of wellness checks as, as necessary for, for individuals that are contacted who perhaps are feeling unwell. We have a team list who manages the line list of contacts that need to be to called, um, oversees the technical um, components of, of the endeavor. And then we have five or six contact tracers who are using this Damaji platform as a survey tool to reach out to individuals and ask them, you know, you, you, we understand you came into contact with somebody suffering from COVID. Do you have any symptoms? Um, are you able to self-quarantine? I'll explain a little bit more about what that involves in the next slide. So very simply to walk you through the, the sort of the, the, the high level algorithm for what contact tracing is looking, what looks like um, the Department of Public Health pushes to us, the team at UCSF, a list of contacts that were enumerated based on case investigations done the day before. And then we get on the phone and we call those individuals. We emphasize that this is, it, this is confidential. Um, that, 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 that it's voluntary and that we, we really want to meet their needs. Um, we recognize that this is an opportunity to educate and inform and as appropriate access, uh, enable them to access important services. In addition, we, we take some demographic details and really importantly, because they're contact with cases, we ask them, do you have any symptoms? If they have symptoms, then we fast track them to a, to a, a, a screening scheduling capability that the, the DPH um, has, has scaled. Um, and if they don't have symptoms, then a couple of things are available to them. First of all, we, 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 we prompt uh, an SMS messaging system that gets sent out to them every day for 14 days so that they, that they get a message. How are you doing? Do you have fever? Do you have cough, et cetera? And if at any point over that 14 days that they, they respond in the affirmative, then one of our team will reach out and again, direct them to testing and, and services. In addition, we recognize that for many people, um, self-quarantining is, is going to be challenging, particularly those, dis those communities, as Maria mentioned, that are uh, disproportionately affected, you know, certain ethnic and, and, and demographic um, uh, 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 yeah, groups within society. And so for those individuals, there is some services available that the DPH and others are offering. And our hope is to offer them the necessary resources so that they can stay at home and self quarantine. Next slide. I just want to sort of make a, a, a clarification here, because I do think like for many people the the, the the term quarantining and isolation are sort of confusing and, 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 and used interchangeably. When I'm referring to isolation, really that refers to individuals suffering from COVID, those people who we know to be symptomatic and, and at, at greatest risk for ongoing transmission. We ask them to isolate for at least seven days from the time of diagnosis and until at least they are 72 hours symptom free in the absence of, uh, of any uh, medications that might mitigate symptoms. But then for those individuals that have been exposed, as I've mentioned now a couple of times, we're, we're asking them to quarantine. They don't have symptoms, but they're at risk for developing symptoms. We want them to stay at home for 14 days. And, and, and so educating individuals as to what that involves is crucial. Next slide. So as I highlighted earlier, you know, contact tracing on its own is not enough. We need incentives to manage quarantine with strong wraparound services. And, and all credit to the Department of Public Health and, the, and the, the isolation and quarantine team, which has been stood up rapidly over the last month. Um, they are doing much of this already. But some of the things that we think that quarantining, that, that this should be available to individuals that are quarantining are, you know, things like masks, thermometers, uh, access to, to food, laundry services if they need it. And so this is my wish list of things that I would like to be able to offer individuals whom we're contacting and saying, you need to 
stay at home for the next two weeks. It, these aren't things that are necessarily available right now, but maybe should be at some point in the future. Um, and so if I had my vision, and so if anybody wants to tweak this, my vision would be that Amazon works with us to develop a quarantine package so that anybody that is a contact that needs to, to, uh, to self quarantine could be able to access for two weeks a set of clear resources from them so that they can stay at home. Next slide. So again, what's the future state of San Francisco contact, tra contact tracing work? Well, let me just say one thing. You know, we are really at the cutting edge of contact tracing in the US, and so already folks are looking to UTSF and DPH for, for lessons learned. But as we move forward and, and move forward fast, I think there are things that we're interested in thinking about. Is there a way to enhance the precision of contact tracing by, by having options for, for contacts to give us their, their, their contact list so that we can do a better job of, of reaching people? Um, could we use publicly available data for example, DMV records, et cetera, to better can contact those individuals for whom we don't have a phone, but we know that they live with somebody, et cetera. Um, are there better ways to rapidly connect contacts to testing capability, either to drive-through testing or home testing capabilities? Certainly the home testing piece is something that Gates Foundation has funded in Seattle. And as I've mentioned now in the slide before, are there better ways that we could support people to quarantine with less effort? Next slide. So clearly it goes without saying that there are tremendous research opportunities here. Um, and, and I think we're just starting to think about what some of the research questions are that we could be asking. You know, we're going to have a chance to track all of these contacts and see who develops symptoms and when. We'll be able to better understand predictors of disease and severity. The Dimaji app will allow us to geographically map contacts, which will obviously give us a textured understanding of disease transmission. I think there's really important research to be done around social networking and understanding disease transmission. And clearly, there are some great implementation science questions that should be that should be answered quickly. We're hoping to mobilize a workforce of librarians who are twiddling their thumbs right now, unable to work here in San Francisco. How good are they at contact tracing? My guess is that they're a lot better at doing it than I will be, given their their uh, their, 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 their fidelity to, to, to rules and, and surveys, et cetera. But, but it will be interesting to look at that kind of question. Um, and overall, how could, we, how could we use this platform to better improve the efficiency of, 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 our, of, 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 our, um, of our efforts? Again, I think there are really interesting behavioral economic questions as well. What kinds of incentives could we put out there for, um, to ensure successful quarantining? Um, and these are questions that hopefully BPH in partnership, maybe with UCSF, we, we can answer in, in, in the weeks and months to come. Next slide. So some closing thoughts. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I, just based on our rapid survey of the available technology that's out there and, and our, our, our sort of our, our pivot to using the Dimaji platform, I think it's clear that there are no silver bullets. We're going to have to use a, an armamentarium of, of different technologies and, and resources to effectively contact trace. Um, it's clear that technology operations and in implementation are all deeply intertwined. And as I mentioned now, contact tracing only gets us half the way there. Social support systems are essential. I've just come off of seven days working on the COVID ID service at San Francisco General. We have not seen a single death on the, on the clinical service, which is a, a testament to the amazing work of our, our, our clinical uh, teams at San Francisco General. But w one of the, the most striking things that we are seeing is that our, our Latinx uh, brothers and sisters are disproportionately affected by the epidemic here in San Francisco. And how can we prioritize resources, communication, and research to, to support that community um, in this moment? I think another final thing to say is that, you know, any technology like this, the, the, the advantage of having something that's simple, an interface that can be easily used, and 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 and, uh, and where training can be ramped up very quickly, is also a high priority. Next slide. So I I, I want to end with just, if I may, like a, a just a personal reflection. Um, 
I, I'm an English doctor. I trained in the UK. Why am I in San Francisco? I came to San Francisco because, um, the, you know, this city and this university led in the HIV response 25 years ago and has a global reputation. First HIV clinic in the country is at SF General. Some of the, the earliest research was done here. And, and it's my sort of optimistic vision that UCSF and the San Francisco Department of Public Health will lead in this moment and others will follow. And certainly I think, you know, as George mentioned at the beginning, we are already seeing the the, the, the dividends of decisive leadership from, from both faculty and, and, and politicians here in, in, in San Francisco. Um, so, so some grounds for optimism, uh, I think, in, in that sense. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the work that I have been involved with has, has included tremendous effort from staff from, from the Institute for Global Health Sciences, most of George's team of, of public health professionals who were working in Africa have been redeployed to this work, and they are working 24 hours a day on this effort, and it's just been a privilege to partner with these incredibly talented folks. I'll end there and uh, hand back to you, Kirsten. Great. Thank you so much uh, uh, to all of the panelists. Um, I think we're going to, Kristen is going to set up for us to all be on the screen and we'll have a little bit more of a roundtable discussion. One thing that I know, Mike, there are several questions um, from people attending, whether whether others can volunteer, whether you're looking for volunteers. Um, I think a lot of people were really interested in, the, in the, uh, mobilizing this contact tracing group. Yeah, so we did our first orientation session last night for city employees and um, and then uh, UCSF medical students as well. We, we welcome others um, to, to partner with us. Um, and if you send me your email, michael.read2 at ucsf.edu, as well as my colleague Jess Celentano, Jessica Celentano, at UCSF.edu, then we will we will triage and and uh, and get back to those that that, that want to volunteer in this effort. Thank you. George is rubbing his brow. I think he's worried I'm going to get inundated by email. Uh, I, the last <laughs> thing Mike needs is a thousand emails by the end of the, tonight to to so don't do it. Okay, hold that thought. <laughs> we'll get, come back to us a week from now. This is not what we need to have happen this second. And if you know anybody in the IT industry, tell them to stay the hell away. Yeah, we don't need all their ideas either, right, at this point in time, if I may be direct. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Well, it's good to see the enthusiasm. So so thank you all. It's been really great to hear the presentations and also to, to sort of look at the questions and enthusiasm online. One of the questions that's come up, and I'd love to get different people's take on this, um, is... Um, is uh, that you know one thing that we are hearing and continuing to learn more about is how much asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people are maybe driving this uh, this uh, pandemic. So how do we think about it from a modeling point of view? How do we think about it from a contact tracing point of view? How do we think about it and like what's the strategy to get back to you know opening up again a little bit more? So who would like to start? Well, I can tell George. you that. Sure. And Travis, and it's just what Travis has to say. Clearly in China, uh, asymptomatic transmission drove a ton of the early transmission before uh, January 23rd, where Wuhan uh, went to uh, lockdown. They're estimating about a quarter of the transmissions came from people who are asymptomatic. They also estimate that maybe as many as, as, as few as 41% of all uh, true cases were diagnosed. And that's not because they were getting underreported. It's because they didn't present for diagnosis or were, you know, either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And that number might be as high as, it might be as low as 20% getting, getting diagnosed. So there's this big backlog. There's a, not, it's not a backlog. There is this group of people who are certainly less symptomatic, who are walking, who could be walking around if we weren't sheltering in place and we weren't wearing masks, which is why we do this stuff. Um, and it's, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's a potential, it has a huge, uh, it's had a huge, uh, kind of basic, uh, role in early transmission and the, and the kind of the exponential rise of, of, uh, infection. All right. So Mike, how are you going to get to work on that? Since, uh, we don't know, <laughs> you just gave us this great model for race and trying yeah. to deal with symptoms. 
Right. I mean, I think it's it, 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 it's a very challenging question. What we are doing is every single case, we're asking them, who did you interact with for the 48 hours before your symptoms developed? Um, so really asking them to go back in time and imagine that, that those two days before, recognizing that there could be some viral shedding and transmission in that period. But this is, a, a, you know, one of the biggest challenges. And clearly, something George has talked about before is if, if, if we're going to reach that population, then we need to massively scale up our testing capability so that we're able to offer testing not only to people with symptomatic disease, but, you know, all close contacts. And we're not at that point right now. Travis, do you have a thought on this from the modeling perspective? How do we think about the asymptomatics? Well, a couple of things. I know that there were some early modeling papers. For example, Jeff Shaman's group was doing models where they were trying to estimate the fraction of, of unreported cases. And I think they were saying originally that it could have been as high as 86% based on their analysis. Now, from the standpoint of building a model, it's not hard to add a category for asymptomatic people. The problem is, is estimating you know, what that is uh, from data. Uh, some, some years ago, when I, when I was with the city and county of San Francisco, uh, we, uh, our, our group um, with, with Tomas Aragon did a model of contact tracing of smallpox. And one of the things we were including was sort of a second ring, you know, contacts of contacts. And, I, you know, that may be just hopeless beyond hopeless at, at this scale. But it was certainly something we included in simulation uh, models of, of uh, smallpox, uh, emergency smallpox response. But by the way, if, if I may, I, I should also, I, I meant to mention that the state of California, the state health department has been coordinating some modeling uh, as well. And I, I can't really speak for what their results are, but I do know that they've been uh, using and working with uh, modeling groups in the Midas consortium as well. So Adam Reedhead and um, Andrea Perriot. Travis, do you want to show some, you, you are teasing us with uh, uh, showing some of your and your, your postdocs uh, local results for our local environment. Would you like to show those? Uh, I, I believe we, we may be able to. I don't know if Lee Warden is, is available to. I think we're trying to get him available, and I don't know if that works. But if it doesn't, I, I hope you can still show us if that's possible. Uh, we could use a couple of, of Lee's slides. if. Uh, if they're available, if not, we could loop, loop back to me in a moment. I don't want to derail the Okay, okay, that's good. Um, some of the questions were, so um, we've talked about needing the, I've heard George talk about the five things that we need to figure out whether we can open back up again. George, do you want to give us your list again? Um, sure. uh, Always happy to pontificate. So <laughs> number one, transmission has to be low. And what does that mean? It means cases, hospitalizations, sero, you know, incidents, directly measured incidents, and uh, directly measured uh, seroprevalence and, and sero incidents. It also means that all the indicators on these, on these um, syndromic surveillance and sentinel surveillance systems we've put together have to be low. Okay, so there has to be low transmission. The second thing is there has to be a ton of testing. Um, we, were made, we made up a number, we calculated a number of 130,000 tests per month in San Francisco, just for San Francisco County. It's that kind of volume that you need to really kind of get through all the contacts, get through all the cases, get through all the people who just want to come in and be tested. You know, all that, it's, it's just, it's just needs to be of that, of that order. Um, the, uh, uh, you need to have hosp available hospital beds um, and uh, ventilators and all that in case you guess wrong. And then there needs to also be, I'm forgetting one. There also be needs to be um, uh, a, uh, a plan for what other pieces of shelter in place we're going to maintain of social distancing. Mm -hmm. Are we all going to wear masks outside? Do people who have any a single gray hair have to stay inside uh, for most of the day? Are we going to telecommute? Keep encouraging people to telecommute. Are we going to stagger the workforce coming back in? We're going to stagger the workforce coming back in. What are we going to do about schools? All that stuff has to get figured out. I know that Mike and Karen and Jess talk to me constantly about when can our kids go back to school? That's all they want to know. You know, um, I guess if you have young enough kids and you're spend the time in the house with them, that is a big deal, but there are all sorts of issues like that, that have to, and, and mass gatherings, forget the giants. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, Does somebody know how, how far are we from uh, test 
testing to the level that you would like to be to have testing availability? Do you know, Mike, I, we're, we're working up to 3,000 a to having the cap yeah i i think we're close to being able to do 3000 tests a day but we're not we're not ordering that number of tests right now so uh the the demand is not um you know meeting our capacity which is a good thing reflects sort of clinician practice from two or three weeks ago um and maybe that's got to change as well and, and i should add the reason we're we're able to do this is that the chan zuckerberg biohub has repurposed itself as a clia approved laboratory clinical laboratory, uh, and they've backed out of some of their research capacity in order to accommodate this. How do we think about the issues that Maria is raising that given that our, our case numbers and our deaths are certainly so low um, for all of those wonderful reasons you described at the beginning, George, but that we have, you know, these outbreaks in the homeless shelter, we see this disproportionate number of, um, of and I think at, at CSFG, it's been monolingual Spanish speakers. So concern that, um, that for all of our efforts and keeping everything in the population low, this is a group that these are populations, vulnerable populations that we need to be concerned of um, uh, uh, because it's important, um, but also because it's uh, these will be continuing sources of infection in the population, presumably. How do we think about uh, what we need to know to do this more effectively? I think number one is realizing that if we don't, it's it's a disaster. Like we just can't ignore these and respond after the fact. I mean, was there a way? And I would love to know what George and Mike think about this. But was there? Could we have prevented the outbreak in the homeless shelter by respond by preempting it with uh, rehousing people in a in a safer context, as opposed to now after the fact, putting people into hotels. Yeah, it's a bit of a moving target. It has to do with the test availability, among other things, um, as that ramped up. But I mean, one of the things we're going to see here writ large is the digital divide. Because all these, you know, Deus ex machina, uh, you know, applications that are going to solve everything magically, just because they work well in Singapore, I don't think really are that applicable to monolingual Spanish speaking gig workers who are living, you know, eight to a room in a, in a, in a, mission, you know, boarding house. Um, it's, it, I think that's dreaming that, that, uh, you know, that's gonna, you know, unless we can pass out cell phones, but what the hell we're spending, we're wasting money in the economy at the speed of light, might as well pass out cell phones. Um, but it, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's hard to envision how exactly all that kind of technology is going to help if people don't have a basic platform to put it on. I think, you know, I'm really struck by the fact that what we're seeing in our contact tracing work and, and my work on the wards last week is that the Latinx community is, is hugely effective, affected in a way that we're not seeing in other communities. And, and so I think at a city level, there has to be a more sophisticated communications strategy that is targeted to those groups so that they can, they can understand their you know the the risk that they're that 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 they're, that they're exposed to, but but also then there needs to be communication or the 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 services are available to these individuals regardless of their immigration status, um, and 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 that they are they're able to avail of, of 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 supportive services so that they can stay at home, even though the the sort of the financial imperatives to work are are, are so great for the for, for many of these poor communities. And I think what, you're really, what we're really seeing here is housing density. And as somebody said, it's like holding, trying to hold ten balloons underwater at the same time. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see a small small cluster. Not this this is small, but we'll continue to see small clusters of transmission as cases are imported, and as they're imported from places that haven't done what we've done to shelter in place and to, and to slow transmission way down. Yeah, lots of lots of people commenting on the chat exactly what you're saying and talking about the specific the specific issues um, uh, and needs uh, in these communities that will also stymie lots of the contact tracing uh, work as as uh, as both of you are talking about. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, Travis, I don't know. I, I think we're, we're we're having problems figuring out how to give Lee access. We don't see Lee on the attendee list. 
Um, so I don't know if you can still show. We have like a, just a, a few minutes left, but. Um, I'll say, thank you, I'm happy to say just a couple of quick words on those slides. Okay. So what, what we did was repurposed a model we've been using for uh, Ebola transmission and measles uh, transmission. And uh, we, we assumed, re, you know, we, we used these branching process tools. We used uh, reasonable assumptions from the, the literature. Now let, let's proceed to the next slide. So again, this is work make, mainly done by Lee Warden and our group. Uh, we could next go to slide. The, next slide. So we, we, um, we, we fit the data to weekly effective R's uh, using a, a sort of likelihood approach. And then uh, once we did that, we projected, we, we just extrapolated uh, the reproduction number forward to produce a case series. We assume that only a certain fraction of cases are detected. And it obviously makes a big difference you know, how you, if, if you assume that that fraction is, is decreasing or increasing. Uh, from the, the predicted number of true cases, we can then feed that into a model of um, hospitalization and deaths, which, which we've been doing. So we could, um, so that I, I believe that this is Alameda County, but again, I would, I would have to ask Lee, we've done the six core Bay area counties We've certainly done San Francisco and Alameda, and I believe we've done the others. Let's proceed to the next slide. And so here, here we have some examples of what might happen if we discontinue shelter in place at different times. These models predict what you would expect, that there would be a, a, a you know, to some degree, a rebound. One of the things that's that's on, on my mind is, uh, you know, related to what was just said, that there, there are, I mean, trying to think that we're going to erect, completely eradicate a disease like this by shelter in place seems wildly optimistic. So what, what seems more likely is that as you get to lower and lower levels uh, of, you know, of, of transmission, the R will seem to increase because you have just pockets of transmission you don't know about. And so I, I think that various projections that have the, the case count going into with high probability into near extinction, which you'll see in various models out there in the world. I believe those are, are probably very optimistic scenarios. So let's continue sure. to the to the next um, slide. And of course, if, if, if R really does go below one and stay there, then we're, we're going to just wipe the disease out. But as I say, I consider this to be highly optimistic. So I think I'm, I may stop there. That's, uh, that's uh, fantastic, and I think uh, brings uh, the importance of a lot of these uh, the, the specific issues, the specific approaches that we've talked about today uh, really in focus uh, for, for the Bay Area, where um, we, we've been fortunate to not see what we've seen in other parts of the country, but obviously have the need to uh, continue to understand how to, how to move uh, these general principles forward and make sure that we can adapt, uh, adapt them to all of the communities in our area well, well, okay well this sorry. yes just one quick sure. thing though lee reminds me those were actually san francisco slides and i do want to emphasize the that the models do support the idea that the early aggressive response that was made by the health departments was hugely important Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, we, we've had about 500 people joining us on this webinar through, throughout this hour and a half. Uh, we've had other people who couldn't get on because uh, we were capped at that number and who were joining us on Facebook Live. Um, so uh, to all of the, the people who joined us, um, uh, we're really, um, I'm sure we could, we would all be clapping if we could, um, but uh, <laughs> but I'm going to clap on everybody's behalf and to thank our, our four speakers for really giving us important perspectives on, on this. Um, and to those of you who are joining, um, our goal is to make a video of this um, available so that others can, uh, can really participate. And since I think that um, we're still going to have issues to discuss, um, and the experts who want their take on it, I'm sure that we will do something like this uh, in, in the near future as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.